I came knocking on your door a million times and you laughed at me. The first encounter with Alex Jones is usually a surreal one. The Austin-based radio mogul has a bombast and delivery that leads to performances like this. I'm not going to get in bed with you. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay. Do you understand that? Ugh, ugh, serious crap. He is a man who, on the record, has stated that the Sandy Hook shooting was staged, that the U.S. government played a part in the Oklahoma City bombing and 9-11, and that Carrie Fisher was murdered to boost Star Wars sales. Oh, and he believes the world is run by interdimensional, shape-shifting child molesters. They're demons. They're frickin' interdimensional invaders, okay? I'll just say it, make fun of me all you want on CNN or wherever, but everyone already innately knows this. These people are not frickin' humans, okay? In the midst of hundreds of Alex Jones tirades on the internet, there's a clip where the provocateur explains his theories on Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. In it, Alex Jones explores a bizarre array of ideas, but his main point is that the Dark Knight trilogy is a propaganda instrument financed by the Department of Defense to justify mass surveillance and the police state. If, for nothing else, the clip is a great watch for its sheer entertainment value alone. And as all informed people know, governments have been fluoridating water supplies for more than 60 years, causing brain damage and cancer. But through all the absurdity, there are some odd gems. And these gems are made all the more strange when they come from ramblings of a paranoid conspiracist. For instance, the statement, the power of images to program the mind is not debated, is not much different from something you'd hear from Zizek or some other cultural theorist. Who is Bane? He's a symbolic demon, a destroyer, a symbol of the Hegelian dialectic. It's pretty much exactly something you'd read in a reputable film journal. But to be clear, this isn't some genius takedown of the Dark Knight. And any accidental insight gleaned from an argument based on an absurd agenda must ultimately be treated with caution. What's useful in watching clips like these is not necessarily their conclusions, but the practice of exploring political subtext in cinema. One of the major gripes of Alex Jones when it comes to blockbusters and propaganda is Hollywood's partnership with the Department of Defense. Many don't realize the United States government often partners with the Hollywood productions if it deems the story and representation of the government appropriate. The relationship between Hollywood and the American military is a long one, and is chronicled by Lawrence Swede in his book Guts and Glory, The Making of the American Military Image in Film. In it, Swede states Hollywood's reputation with the DoD is one of mutual exploitation. Filmmakers get equipment and locations to add production value, while the military has creative influence on its representation and culture. It suddenly occurred to me, said Swede, that people in the U.S. have never seen the U.S. lose a war. And when President Johnson said we can go into Vietnam and win, they believed him because they had seen 40 years of war movies that were positive. But not all movies qualify for help from the Department of Defense. The vast majority of productions are turned down and some production companies prefer to not coordinate with the military. A famous example of this is Joss Whedon's first Avengers film. The Department of Defense had an infamous gripe with the film due to its unreality. But it wasn't the thundering demigod or the green Mr. Hyde that made the military confused. Instead, it was the interactions between the international agency SHIELD and the US government that the DOD found cause for concern. Besides allowing the production to film some Humvees, the US military mostly left the Avengers team alone. But even without the influence of the DOD, the Avengers still has plenty of material for someone to consider a propaganda reading of the film. If the Dark Knight inspired Alex Jones to go off on his tirade, I can only imagine what the Avengers movie would inspire. To Jones, Tony Stark must be a globalist on scale with Hillary Clinton selling weapons around the world. And like the scientist turning frogs gay, Bruce Banner is a corrupt green monster who represents the overreach of science. And what is Captain America but a shill for the military industrial complex? But more than provide the subtext to a bizarre Alex Jones interpretation, the Avengers offers plenty of material for normal audiences to understand what roles propaganda plays in modern Hollywood. When we say propaganda, we don't mean some intentional messaging program by a government. We've already stated that the government didn't want a part in the making of the Avengers. Instead, the propaganda present in the Avengers is a more subliminal, implicit one. To borrow the term from cultural critic Slavoj Žižek, what's at play in the Avengers is ideology. These are ideas that are so ingrained in a society or a group of people, they either one, don't recognize they exist, or two, 
have no other way of thinking about the world. So who are the heroes of the Avengers? There's a capitalist in Tony Stark, a patriot in Captain America, a scientist in Bruce Banner, and the son of God in Thor. It's likely that the widespread appeal of the Avengers has to do with the four main characters representing the four major pillars of American life. The economy, the military, science, and religion. No one is suggesting this is conscious or deliberate, but in the attempt to craft a story of mass appeal, the ideology that describes the social order of that mass would naturally come through. In fact, most popular films say a lot about the societies they were created in. So the next time you enjoy a blockbuster, try to consider not only what the movie says about your community, but also what it means for your place in it.